Hello everyone, my name is Christian and I'm the CDF noob. In this video we're going to have a look at the third Narnia challenge from Over the Wire. After we've used and analyzed our first shellcode in the last video, we'll be using what we learned so far to exploit a proper buffer overflow. As always, I'm no security professional, hence the CDF noob, but I'm interested in the topic and try to share what I learned so far. So let's get started with Narnia 2. Again, we start by inspecting the challenge files, and again, we have an elf executable and a C source file from which it was compiled. After opening Narnia 2, we see that in line 22, a character array of size 128 is declared. In line 24, the if clause checks whether a parameter is provided, and if not, prints to the console how the program should be used. Then in line 26, the program exits with exit code 1. In line 28, the first and only argument to the program is copied into the character array buff with string copy. Right after that, the contents of buff are printed to the console with printf. And in line 31, the program exits with exit code 0. Let's analyze how the program behaves when we run it with different parameters. We start by using the short string. In this case, that's four a's. As expected, the program prints out the four a's to the console and exits. We know that buff is 128 characters wide, so it might be good to try a string that is longer. We create a string of 150 a's with python and use those as the parameter for Narnia 2. The program suck faults. Interesting. When inspecting the source code, we saw that string copy does not check the length of the input. This seems to be the problem that we can use to gain a shell as Narnia 3. We know that the program sack falls at a certain point, but what exactly is the length of the input that makes the program crash? To find out the exact length, we use a shell script to try out the different lengths after 128. We know that the character array can hold 127 characters and the null byte to terminate the string, so 128 characters is the first length that could crash the program. This little script here that I created on the server in a new temp directory simply executes Narnia 2 with an increasing number of A's and in line 10 prints out at what number of A's the program crashes. Executing the script results in the message Narnia 2 crashes at 132. This means that entering 132 A's will issue a sec fault. Let's analyze what happens with the program when entering 132 A's in GDB. For this, we start Narnia 2 inside of GDB and run the program at first with 131 A's. Everything is fine and the program prints out the expected big number of A's. Now we run the program with 132 A's. And the program sec faults in libc start main. We can inspect 20 words before ESP and see a lot of A's or 41's in hex. Then we can see the null byte in the bottom right corner. It seems that it overwrote something important. After setting the disassembly flavor to Intel, we continue by disassembling main and setting a breakpoint at the end of main, at main plus 82. We then restart the program with 131 A's and analyze the stack again. The 20 words before ESP are all filled up with A's, but what about the 4 bytes at ESP? Right at ESP we see the value F7E2A286, but what is that value? We examine it and see that it is somewhere in libc start main. This is the return address of Narnia 2's main function and inserting one A more results in overwriting this return address. Now this is where the fun starts. Let's try to overwrite the return address with something predictable. In this case I chose four Bs. So again we use a little Python script and hope that the program sec faults at 42, 42, 42, 42. And perfect. Everything worked out as expected. We are able to overwrite the return address. But what can we do with that? We need some kind of shellcode that we can execute. But where shall we put it? We start our input string with a lot of A's. We could try to replace those with our shellcode and then change the return address to the start of our shellcode. Let's try it out by first finding out where buff starts. For this we will restart Narnia 2 and at a breakpoint analyze the 140 bytes before ESP. We can now see that buff starts at ffffd5b8. So if we start our input with the shellcode, we change the return address to the start of buff. So let's build a new exploit string. We'll reuse the shellcode by Magnifico from the last video. First we print the shellcode, followed by 132 minus 25 a's. Minus 25 because of the length of the shellcode. And finally comes the return address. 
We start Narnia 2 with a new parameter and... Oh, the program sec faults at b 8 d 5 ff Of course, because I forgot to turn the bytes around due to endianness. With that fixed, we should be fine. The program no longer sec faults, but we still don't get a shell. This is weird. Maybe we'll try out another shell code, just in case. I found this one by Hamza Megahat on Shellstorm, which I'm going to use. Again, it's the same thing. We start with the shellcode, followed by 132 minus this time 23 A's, and in the end the correct address of buff. This time we can gain a shell. Nice. Let's try this outside of GDB to get a password for the next challenge. Hmm. It fails, but why? Seems that executing Narnia 2 inside of GDB somehow changes the stack which will cause the program to fail outside of GDB. But there is an easy workaround. We can use a knob slat. In short, we add a couple of knob opcodes, which do nothing, followed by the shellcode we want to execute. This way, we do not have to guess the correct address where the shellcode will be positioned beforehand and can simply choose an address somewhere near to the shellcode inside the knob slat and the instruction pointer will slide down to the shellcode. Let's try it out. We start our knob slat consisting of 132 minus 23 knobs followed by the shellcode and in the end our desired return address. Of course the sec faults, because we are using an old return address and we have to use an address inside of the knob slat. After trying out some values, I found that the following works perfectly. Let's see who we are with whoMI. Narnia 3, perfect. So we grab the password and we're done. We exploited the buffer overflow using a knob slat, but in GDB we were able to use the address of a shellcode directly. So is it possible to get rid of the knob slat outside of GDB? After reading up on the topic and hacking the art of exploitation, I found a way to. I'll put a link to the book in the video description. It is a great introduction into binary exploitation and helped me quite a lot. In the book, John Erickson explains that the length of the program's name is the issue and that there is a way to calculate the address of an environment variable beforehand. We can use an environment variable to store the shellcode and use that in our exploit. So we create one that contains the shellcode like so. But let's first try to access the shellcode from inside of GDB. We start Narnia 2 with GDB and the environment variable we want. Then, after setting the disassembly flavor, we set a breakpoint again at main plus 82. Now finally, we can run the program with the 132 A's for padding and the 4 B's as the return address. We stop at main plus 82 and can inspect the stack. We go through the environment variables with the following command and search for the variable by incrementing the position of the pointer. At position 4, we have our variable egg, which holds the shellcode. We can inspect the variable with the following command and we see egg equals and then the 23 bytes of our shellcode. Now we can try to rerun the program with the address of the shellcode as the return address. The correct shellcode starts here. So we run the program again with the reversed address. And bingo, we have a shell. Now what do we need to run this outside of GDB? Is there a way to pre-calculate the address of an environment variable? Yes, there is, and John Erickson created a little C program that does the trick, which I'll shamelessly copy and use here. The idea is pretty easy. All environment variables are available on the stack and are shifted by the length of the program's name. If we know the name of the program beforehand, we can use this little formula here and pre-calculate the address of the environment variable in a target program. I compile the program as an x86 executable, then I export the environment variable with the shellcode. And finally, run get env address with the variable egg and the full name slash narnia slash narnia2. The program tells us that egg will be at ffffde96. So let's try it out and run our exploit outside of GDB. We are able to gain a shell. And we are narnia3. Perfect. So we didn't need the knob slat. One thing that bugged me was that I couldn't get the shellcode by Magnifico to work. Maybe it'll work with the new env variable trick. So I overwrote the env variable with Magnifico's shellcode, reran get env address, and finally called Narnia2 with the new address. Again, I can get a shell, so the shellcode works, but if I try the same shellcode with the knob slat, nothing happens. I'm not sure what the problem is, but at least I was able to solve the challenge. If you have an idea what I did wrong, please leave a comment below the video. One last thing I wanted to do is having a look at the shellcode by Hamza Megahat and understand what it does. As in the last video, I write the shellcode to a file and disassemble it with the NetWide disassembler. 
Now let's have a look at what the instructions do. The first instruction zeroes out EAX, then EAX or zero is pushed to the stack. Afterwards, two D words are pushed to the stack, which contain only values in the ASCII range. So it seems that this must be the program name to execute. And looking it up on an ASCII table confirms this. The two D words contain HS slash slash and NIB slash, which is slash bin slash slash SH reversed. Now ESP, which points to the file name, is moved into EBX. This is so syscall11 knows what to execute. Then again, zero is pushed to the stack by pushing EAX to the stack. Afterwards, EBX, which points to the file name, is pushed to the stack and ESP is moved into ECX. I'm not sure why the shellcode does that, since one could have simply set ECX to zero, but I guess there must be a reason. If you know it, please leave a comment below the video. Finally, AL is set to OXB, which is the setup for the interrupt that happens in the next instruction, which triggers the syscall exec.we. If that was a little bit too fast, I went through the shellcode by Magnifico in more detail in the previous video on Narnia 1. I hope you found this video interesting and could learn a little bit about buffer overflows and how to exploit them. If you liked the video, please give it a like, and if you want to see me solving more CTF and wargame challenges, please subscribe to my channel. If you have any feedback for me, or know what I did wrong with the shellcode by Magnifico, please also leave a comment below the video. Thank you and until next time.